Hi guys, it's Mrs. Sloan and welcome to chapter two, basic chemistry for AP Bio. Um, I'm gonna be moving through this pretty quickly because you've already had an introduction to chemistry last year in your Foundations of Science class. So hopefully this will be a review. I'm gonna make myself a little bit, oh, not yet. Um, remember in the, in the descriptor, descriptor down below, there is a link to your Google Notes that you're gonna to wanna to use to take notes on. I have a copy of them here as well. So what I'll be doing is whenever there's a place for you to fill in those notes, I'll let you know, give you time so you can do that as you're watching this presentation. OK. All right. And you have a copy of this presentation, too. So I'm a little bit smaller and I'm going to go in present mode. And Mr. Sloan has started um, mowing the lawn. So maybe we will <laughs> we will hear the lawnmower, too. Woohoo! All right. Chapter two, basic chemistry. The first thing I wanna show you is just the periodic table of elements, and we'll be going through what a period in a group is, right? Um, periods are the horizontal rows, and then groups are vertical, and we're gonna be looking at some different characteristics of this. Um, if you Google this, the periodic table of elements and pictures and words, it's interactive. You can click on it and bring up different elements. So I just wanted to show you that. Um, when we look at the types of elements that are found in the earth versus the elements that are found in our body, you can see this chart. Take a minute just to analyze this graph. So um, when you look at CHNOPs, that is just a way to remember the, um, the elements that are found in the human body. All right. So if we go to the introduction where you have CHNOPs, why don't you add in your notes, basic to life and make up 95% of the body weight. Okay, basic to life and make up 95% of the body weight. So hopefully you know what, what each of those elements stand for. Um, it's carbon, you do the rest, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, all right? Good job, see how smart you are? All right, so next um, we need to talk about the parts of an atom. So the way I remember this is I call it the Adam story. It's super lame. I'm going to make myself bigger, but you are never going to forget this ever, ever, ever again. All right. Let me back up just a little bit. Okay, here we go. Ready? The And my phone keeps going off. The Adam story. Atoms are made out of protons. See, I'm making positive. Neutrons and electrons. The protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus. Atomic mass and the electrons are in energy levels 2, 8, 1832, 8, 8, 8 is great octet rule. So I'm going to explain that. You're going to learn it now and it's going to help you forever. It's so lame and simple, but I promise it works. Okay, so one more time with me. The atom story atoms are made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. That's our charge. The protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus, atomic mass. The electrons are in energy levels. They're always moving around. Lowest energy level holds two, two, eight, 1832, eight, eight, eight is great octet rule. Because we're gonna learn that atoms, when they try to become stable, they can do it one of two ways. They can either fill up their outermost energy level, that's super stable, or they can fill it up to eight. And that's referring to the octet rule and spins, and that's good enough for that. We'll put a pin in that. So when we look at the atomic structure, okay, and you look at your notes right there, uh, for atomic structure, I want you to put the smallest part of an element that displays the properties of that element. Okay, so we're looking at an atom. It's the smallest part of that element that displays the properties of that element. There's nothing magical about those words. You're never going to get asked a question exactly like that. You just want to understand it, right? Smallest part of that element where it still has those same pro properties is an atom. On atomic number, the atomic number by definition is always equal to the number of protons. Okay, so atomic number is the number of protons. Now, in a neutral atom, however many protons you have, you're going to have the same number of electrons. Yes, because protons are positive charge and electrons are negative. So neutral, you're going to have the same amount. 
but do not say that the atomic number is equal to the number of electrons because that's not true because an atom can gain and lose electrons. And do you remember what that's called if you gain or lose an electron? Hopefully you said ion. Now, if you said isotope, that's referring to the number of uh, the neutrons. You can have different numbers of neutrons for the same element because what determines what an element is, is the atomic number and that's the number of protons but the number of neutrons can vary that's an isotope and the number of electrons can vary that's an ion okay so on atomic number number of protons and in a neutral atom it will also be equal to the number of electrons the atomic mass remember the protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus atomic mass so your atomic mass is equal to the number of protons plus neutrons all right, let's look at, if you take a look at this chart, just take a minute, should be easy peasy lemon squeezy. You can see the charges, you can see um, the mass. Electrons are so small, right? We're not gonna worry about quarks right now, so don't, don't worry about that. And it shows the location of each part. All right, take a look here, all right? Let me move myself somewhere else. Take a look right here and you can see, um, helium okay when you're looking at helium right here you can tell that it has its mass number up here on top and its atomic number now if you know the mass is the number of protons plus neutrons is the mass and in this case it's four right and if you take away the atomic number the atomic number is equal to the number of protons so four minus two is two that means i know how many neutrons it has i also know how many electrons it has because if it has two positive charges it has two negative charges hopefully that was super easy if not rewind and watch that again okay let's take something like lithium over here okay so you can see and and Try to write down protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? And how many electrons would you have in the first energy level? How many would you have in the second energy level? See if you can kind of do that. Jot it down on a piece of paper, in your notes, wherever, okay? So your mass is on top. That's the bigger number. That's seven, right? Of those seven items that are in your atomic mass, how many of them are protons? Three, right? Because the atomic number is below that. So... If three are protons, that means I have four neutrons, right? Four neutrons, three protons, okay? And that's a total of seven in my atomic mass. How many electrons do I have? Well, it's the same number of protons I have. I have three electrons. How many can fit in the first energy level? Remember, it was two, eight, 18, 32. So how many can I fit in the first energy level? Two. First energy levels all full up. How many do I have left? One it's going in the next energy level. Now, when you think about that next energy level, how much does the second energy level hold? First one holds two, the next one is eight, right? So is lithium stable or do you think it's gonna be reactive? Hopefully you said reactive because it only has one valence electron and that one can hold up to eight. So it's down by seven. What are the odds it's gonna find seven, steal them? Probably not, not not high, right? It might share with somebody who has seven and it can become stable that way or it might decide to ditch its electron. And this is why we need to understand the chemistry, right? Because we need to understand why, why one element interacts with another element and predict what's going to happen. And that helps us to understand life quite a bit. All right, we'll hit that again. Let me get you on another page. Okay, isotopes. What's an isotope? That's the next one in your notes. Do you remember? It's a very in the number of neutrons, right? So atoms of the same element, but they vary in their number of neutrons. So you can put that down on your notes, okay? All right, you've got that. Pause if you need a little more time. Okay, um, so if you look at these isotopes, these are all isotopes of helium. So if I were gonna ask you, what do all these isotopes of helium, what do they have in common? What's the thing they have in common? Every single one of them, right? Did you say two protons? Cause you can see, right? Two protons here in red, but this helium, helium five, it has three neutrons, right? Helium six, still two protons because that's what makes it helium, the two pro protons. 
right? But it has four neutrons. So this is another isotope of helium. All right, next. Um, how, oh, I better get smaller. How could you use isotopes? This is just a list of different, different ways isotopes are used. Um, could be radiation, um, it could be in research, and they could be tracers. Um, um, they could be used for multiple purposes, the thickness of metal because of how far an isotope could travel. So I just wanted to give you some various ways they could be used. All right, and moving on. Let's look at a periodic table. Is this a complete periodic table? No, it is not, right? So I've just got it real simplified for you here. Remember, periods are horizontal, okay? Periods, and then groups are vertical. Now, when we look at hydrogen right here, its atomic number is one and um, its mass is one right here, whereas helium, its atomic number is two. So hydrogen has one proton, helium has two, but its mass is four. So let's just review for a minute hydrogen. What does that mean? If its atomic number is one and its mass is one, then how many neutrons does it have? Hopefully you said zero, right? Because the mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And since the mass is one, and you know one of those has to be a proton, then you know for sure it doesn't have any neutrons. What's all this business 1.008? You know, why aren't these whole numbers 12.01? Do you ever have part of a neutron or part of a proton? No, what they're showing you there is they're averaging all the different isotopes. Remember what isotopes are? When you vary the number of neutrons. So they're averaging all the different isotopes and that's the mass that you're seeing right here. Okay, that's why it's varying. Okay, let's look at lithium and let's look at hydrogen and see if they have anything in common, all right? They have different number of protons, they have different number of neutrons, they have different number of electrons, but why are they in this same group? And hopefully you remember this, right? So since hydrogen has one proton, then it has how many electrons? One, right? First energy level will hold one electron, or it will hold two electrons and we're putting one in there. So it has one valence electron. Lithium right here, okay, its atomic number is three. So it has three protons, which means it has three electrons. How many electrons will it put in its first level? It'll put two, that means it has one in its next level. So its outermost um, level, energy level, has one electron just like hydrogen. Now let's look at sodium, okay? He has different number of protons, different number of neutrons, different number of electrons, but how are they similar? Well, the, he has 11 protons, so therefore he has how many electrons? 11, right? So let's put those electrons away. How many can the first level hold? Two. How many can the next level hold? Eight. What's two plus eight? 10. How many electrons do we have? 11. So one electron in the outermost energy level. So when you look at a periodic table, what that's helpful to know is everybody here in the first group has one electron, and from that we can predict its behavior, okay? And if you look here at number two, guess what? They all have two, okay? And if you look over, they all have three. Here's carbon, he has four, okay? And so does everybody else in his group. And then you can see five, six, seven, and eight. Now let's go over here to this last group. Those are called the, do you remember, noble gases? And noble gases all behave the same way. You know why? Their outermost energy level is full or octet rule, it has eight. Therefore, they don't need anybody. They don't need to react with any other element to get stable. They're happy in and of themselves. That's why they're called the noble gases. They're kind of standoffish. But if you just go one row back, right, or two rows back here to oxygen, look at oxygen. Oxygen has eight protons, so that means it has eight electrons. How many does it fit in the first level? Two, okay? Eight minus two is six. So it has six valence electrons. It's two away from being happy. So it will have and want to bond or share or steal some electrons so it can get its outermost energy level to eight. All right, now let's work our way across. Let's look at the periods. So the periods is what energy level you are in. So if you look here, hydrogen, the first energy level, remember can hold two electrons. 
hydrogen has one, so he's in the first, first energy level. Helium has two, so he's also in the first energy level. Okay, so when you go across here in your periods, then that's telling you what energy level your electrons are residing in. If you look here, lithium has his first energy level filled and one extra. First energy level filled and two extra, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So everybody in that period all the way across are in the second energy level and you can get it third energy level and so on. So when you look at a periodic table, when you see where an element is on the periodic table, you can determine how it will react with other elements. Okay, so if you look at your notes, the only thing you had to, do, to add to your notes on there that I left blank is on groups, the vertical columns are arranged by number of valence electrons. How many valence electrons do you have? Everybody in this group has one valence electron. Everybody in this group has two valence electrons. Periods are the horizontal rows, and that is equal to um, the electron's energy level, the energy level that it's in, 2, 8, 18, 32. We don't need to worry right now about transition metals or elements, anything like that, right? We just want to know why does this element react in this way with this other element to form this mole molecule because that's going to affect that molecule's behavior. And we know atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, right? So our molecules make up our organelles and cells. So we want to understand their behavior. All right, next slide, okay? Your next slide, I think you probably got this. Um, each level contains a certain number of orbitals, two electrons per orbital and a certain number of electrons. And we already went over that, two, eight, 18, 32, okay? And in when we do this, for some reason I still have this slide. Um, when we do this, we will stay right there. When we talk about um, electrons jumping to higher energy levels, they're going to be able to do that because they received energy in some way. So their electrons gain that energy and they jump to a higher energy level. They're going to give off energy as they. Um, go down to a lower energy level. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about specifically photosynthesis. Now, I'm going to go back to this slide I skipped. Okay. And sorry about that. The key, okay, to how an element is going to act, remember, is the number of electrons in their outermost energy level. Okay. So here, these are our protons and our neutrons. And out here, we have our electrons. And that's going to de determine how that particular element reacts. So put that down on your notes for the key, right? The key is the number of electrons in the outer shell determines whether an atom reacts with other atoms or not, or just what I have written right there, okay? And an electron boost, this slide, um, you want to add when electrons absorb energy, when electrons absorb energy, they are boosted to higher energy levels. They are boosted to higher energy levels. All right, now everything we did right there, okay, uh, underneath 2.1 chemical elements, actually if you look at the College Board, this is supporting the topic for 1.2, okay, for Unit 1, um, 1.2 if you look on your HyperDoc. Um, now this next topic we're going to go into is in molecules and compounds, and that's going to support 1.2 and 1.3. All right, so now, oh look, I'm sulfur. Okay, let's go on over here. <laughs> maybe, maybe I will go over here. Okay, here we go. What does each molecule want to do? So if we look at hydrogen right here, hydrogen has one valence electron. And remember, the way you get stable or get happy is that you have your outermost energy level full or you have it to eight. So hydrogen needs another electron. So he's probably going to react with another element in order to get stable. Same thing for carbon, same thing for nitrogen, same thing for oxygen. So let's look to see how that happens, okay? The number of electrons determines reactivity. Does an atom need an electron to become stable? Does it want to ditch an electron? Will that help it become stable? Maybe it wants to share, and that's your motivation behind bind bonding. 
So there are two basic type of bonds. All right. Well, actually way more than that. Okay. But right now I'm just going to talk to you about um, covalent bonds and ionic bonds. Now covalent bonds, what happens there is one maybe um, needs some electrons and another element needs some electrons. So what they decide to do is share their outermost um, energy levels share those outermost electrons in order to become stable. And I'll give you some examples of that. A second way is you might have an element um, like hydrogen who just says, you know what? I don't like having just this one valence electron. I'm going to ditch it entirely. Now, if you have one proton and one electron and you ditch the negative charge, then what are you going to become? you're gonna become positively charged, right? Because you don't have a balance. So you will now have a positive charge. Another element that gained an electron has an additional negative charge, right? And what do opposites do? They attract. And that type of bond is called an ionic bond. So let's start um, with why do molecules bond? You wanna add four stability there in your notes, four stability. They want to be completed. You complete. All right, so I want to review one more time ions versus isotopes, so make sure you're clear and you know the difference between the two, right? Ion is when you gain or lose an electron, resulting in a negative or positive charge, and an isotope is where the number of neutrons varies, right? Now, what is that going to change? It will change something. It'll change the atomic mass, right? Because you're going to have additional neutrons or you might have lost some neutrons. All right, so let's start with ionic bonds. Now, it must have something to do with ions. So these are ions. Here, sodium has lost an electron here. Um, calcium has lost two electrons. That's why it has a positive charge. Chlorine has gained an electron. That's why it has a negative charge. So those are ions, right? And here you can see sodium has this one valence electron right here. Now, if it gives up that valence electron, then the energy level below it has eight. And remember, eight is great. That's stable. So that's what sodium does here. He gives up an electron, but the cost of that stability is he has a positive charge. Now, chlorine is just short one electron. So it wants just one more in order to have eight valence electrons. So by it accepting that electron from sodium, it is stable. But what comes along with gaining that electron and that stability, it has a negative charge. Now, what are opposites going to do? They're going to attract. And that's a good example of an ionic bond. And sodium is a gas, um, chlorine, um, poisonous, right? But together they form salt, which if you have too much of it could be a poison too. So ionic bonding, first you form an ion, you're putting this in your notes, first you form an ion when an atom gains or loses an electron. Second, you have an attraction between oppositely charged ions. You have an attraction between oppositely charged ions. And your example there is salt. All right, next. Okay, what is that salt? Okay, yay. Okay, covalent, bond, covalent bonding, this is when you share electrons. Now, sometimes when people share something, they share it perfectly fair, but oftentimes it's not exactly the same. Somebody has a little bit more and somebody has a little bit less there in the sharing. So we're gonna compare, talk about sharing. Now, for instance here, okay, you have carbon, sharing with another carbon. And in this case, they're sharing not one pair of electrons, but two pairs of electrons. And that's because carbon tends to make four bonds. Why? Carbon has four valence electrons. Its atomic number is six. It puts two in the first energy level, and then um, it has four valence electrons. So to get happy, it's got to make four shares. So here, this carbon is sharing, hydrogen has one valence electron, and it's sharing with one of carbon's valence electrons. So now hydrogen is happy because it has these two rotating around it, and the carbon's starting to get happy. It's got another hydrogen over here that gives him number two, and then he's sharing two with this other carbon here. So that gives him a total of eight. Now, you, another way to represent this is with these lines. This is called not a single bond, but this would be a double bond between these two carbons. Between the hydrogen and carbon, that is a single bond. All right, here for oxygen, 
Okay, this is a diatomic molecule. Um, hydrogen will do the same thing to form H2. So oxygen is sharing two pairs of electrons between each other. Okay, so that is a, um, a covalent bond. Now, here I've shown you hydrogen. It's more stable if it's bond bonded with itself, right? Or as long as it gets one more electron. Look here, you can see carbon bonding with four hydrogens. Hopefully this is making complete sense to you. Okay, now where they are in space, this is going to have a lot to do with where the electrons and the orbitals are in each of those energy levels. And we're going to see a good example of that with water, and that's coming up. So put a pin in that. I want to talk to you about the difference between polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. Now, when you share fair, when you share absolutely fair, then you will have what's called a nonpolar covalent bond. Everybody is sharing the electrons equally. When one molecule is more electronegative than another, it has a stronger pull on those electrons. So let me give you an example of something that has a strong pull, and that's oxygen. So when oxygen and hydrogen share, oxygen is like, I'll share, but over here, and the electrons are a little bit closer to the oxygen than they are to the ion uh, to the hydrogen. Now, they're not an ion. It's not that the hydrogen has completely lost his electron and oxygen has taken it. It's just they're sharing it but the electrons are closer to that oxygen molecule and that's called a polar covalent bond. So let's go here, next slide. Okay, all right, next slide, here we go. So there are three important inorganic molecules that I wanna draw your attention to. Oxygen, okay, um, which we breathe in, right? And it's used in cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide, you and I exhale that, but a plant could use that as a reactant for photosynthesis and water. These are your three important inorganic molecules. They are inorganic because they do not contain carbon, except, I know, for carbon dioxide, but it's a very simple form, okay? So it is considered inorganic. Now, we're gonna be talking about water in our next video, put a pin in that. But um, I want to just introduce it to you right now because water, because oxygen has a stronger pull, which you can see right here, okay? Oxygen ends up becoming not an ion, but it becomes slightly negative. So here, this red is oxygen. Hydrogen, um, you can see here. And what ends up happening is oxygen pulls on the electron a little bit more, and so the oxygen becomes slightly negative of a water molecule, whereas the hydrogen becomes slightly positive. So where that comes into play is when you have two water molecules, because you know opposites attract, so if you have a slightly positive hydrogen atom right here and a slightly negative oxygen, then this weak attraction, but a very important bond, is called a hydrogen bond. All right. Now, you see hydrogen bonds in other places besides water. Um, your code book is DNA, and it is two strands of nucleotides held together by what? Yes, hydrogen bonds. Proteins held in their um, tertiary or quaternary structure, often hydrogen bonds. And proteins are held in the right configuration if they're an enzyme, critical to its functionality. Okay, so let's take a look at this picture just for a minute. Okay, big breath in. Coming to a close of this video. Here is one water molecule in the middle. This line right here between oxygen and hydrogen represents a covalent bond, and it is a polar covalent bond, and oxygen has a stronger pull on it. That's why it is slightly negative. The hydrogen is slightly positive. All of these water molecules are connected via hydrogen bonds. Weak, weak bonds, but strong altogether. They're like Velcro, right? If you had just one little piece of Velcro, right? Not super strong, but if you had a suit of Velcro and a wall, you could run and stick to the wall because all of those little pieces of Velcro are very strong together. This is why you've experienced the effects if you've ever done a belly flop into a pool because all those water molecules are hanging on to each other and your body comes at it, and you're gonna smack right on there. And if you were from a higher elevation, when you landed on that water, it could have killed you. But if you go in diving and 
you know, pointing your fingers and you're diving in there, you're breaking that surface tension with just the tips of your fingers and kind of parting the water because then you can kind of push away and enter that water without smacking on your whole body. Those are all hydrogen bonds, one water molecule connected to another. So on your notes where it says hydrogen bonding, weak attractive force between two different charge molecules or two different polar molecules, they are strong together, found in DNA, protein structure, bodies of water, all right? And I think this is where, here you can see another picture, and you can see the polar covalent bond is between, in a singular water molecule, between an oxygen and a hydrogen, but these dot, dot, dot here, those are the hydrogen bonds. All right, and we're going to take a pause here, and we'll do the chemistry of water in a separate video.